Thank you all for being here today. My name is Gary. I'm the pastor here at Aspire Church. I haven't met you already. I look forward to meeting you after the service. You can stop by and uh, introduce yourself to us. We'd love to get connected with you and get you more connected to the family of Aspire Church San Marco. Um, I've got a little poll in a survey. I think I know this for most of you, but just, just so that we can all know that we're all on the same page here. Um, how many of you have lived in Florida for more than 10 years? Raise your hand if you've lived in Florida. For more. Okay, would you raise your hand if you've lived in Florida for less than 10 years? Okay, we have a few. What about less than five years? Okay, a few. What about less, uh, what about less than two years? Okay, we've got a couple. Okay, good, good, that works. So here's what I've come to know. I've lived in Florida most of my life. Um, I, I wasn't born here, I just got here as fast as I could. And while Sherry and I did leave for about 15 years, we got back as fast as we could. And so I've lived most of my life in Florida. But here's what amazes me as I go about anywhere else in the country. It amazes me what people think about Florida who aren't from here. Uh, they, they honestly have a, an opinion about Florida that sometimes I just scratch my head and I think I've lived there for most of my life. And I, I don't, there is a fear of Florida. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. People have two responses to Florida. They either think it is basically... It is basically about a mouse with a beach around it. That's all there is to it. Or they are terrified of alligators and sharks and Florida man. Y'all know who Florida man is, right? You read about him in the paper or see him on the news all the time. Florida man and then you, something crazy comes after that headline, right? People who don't live here and who don't come here much, they really do think that we who live in Florida are constantly dodging alligators, dodging sharks, and fighting off Florida man. That's what they think about us in some cases. But as, as scared as they might be of Florida man, alligators, and sharks, there's something else they really should be more afraid of. In fact, there's a video to show you uh, sinkholes. Sinkholes are a serious problem in the state of Florida. I don't know if you know this or not, this is a sinkhole actually in Ocala, Florida that really opened up not that long ago. Just the ground opened up and there it was and water's pouring down into it. It happens all the time. In fact, we've got a picture of some apartments that fell into a sinkhole in the state of Florida. Now, if you really wanna be afraid of sinkholes, let me show you this next map because this is a map from the state of Florida of sinkholes in the state of Florida. <laughs> now, I don't know about y'all, I'm not afraid of alligators. I'm not really afraid of sharks. I'm really not afraid of Florida man, but I am a little concerned about the sinkholes <laughs> in the state of Florida. The cost to Floridians over the past 15 years has averaged $300 million a year in sinkhole damage over the last 15 years. That's a lot of sinkholes in the state of Florida. Now, you might be asking yourself, what do sinkholes have to do with the care and feeding of the human soul? And I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Because <clears throat> there are times in our lives where we're going on and we think everything is fine and a sinkhole opens up underneath our soul. You ever been there? Something unexpected happens and the ground gives way and it feels like you are falling into a spiritual sinkhole. Most of the times these things are sudden they're unexpected, they're unforeseen, and it happens and you feel as if there's nothing you could do. You can't go back suddenly after the sinkhole opens up and make much of a change. Sinkholes open up in our lives. Maybe you've had a sinkhole open up in your life. A situation that happened and it felt like the ground just gave way from out from under you. And everything you thought you believed, everything you thought you built your life upon suddenly began to collapse in on itself. And here's where, this, here's where this relates to our souls, because if we're going to care and feed our souls, you need to know that your soul needs a foundation. Your soul needs a foundation. Now, this might seem like a no-brainer. Everybody knows that if you're going to build something, especially in the state of Florida, you better make sure that you have a good foundation. But let me ask you this. What if the thing that you were building wasn't something that was just supposed to last for 50, 60, 100, even 200 years, but what if the thing that you were trying to build was supposed to last for eternity? That would require a very different foundation, a much stronger foundation. Your soul needs a foundation that will last for eternity because your soul is eternal. 
You're not just a self, you're a soul. Your soul is the most valuable part of you and your soul was designed to last for eternity and your soul needs a foundation that will hold it for all eternity. So what kind of foundation would that look like? Well, open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter three. We're gonna be looking at something Paul said about a foundation that I think will really help us as we look at our own souls and say, how do we care and feed for our soul by making sure it is on the firm foundation? 1 Corinthians chapter three, beginning in verse 10. Here's what Paul says. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Now, just to be clear, Paul is writing this to a group of believers that are living in the city of Corinth. He's writing to the church at Corinth. And he is specifically talking about how he came in and he laid a foundation for this church to be built. And you might think, well, if he's talking about a church, what does that have to do with my soul? Well, a a church is only a collection of human souls. A church is not a building. A church is not a, a meeting on your calendar every week. A church is not a program. A church is not an institution. A church is a collection of human souls. And so what is true for the church is also true for every human soul. And Paul is saying, I came in and there needed to be a foundation laid for this church, just like there needs to be a foundation for every soul. And then other people came after him and began to build on that foundation that was laid. And he goes on to say in verse 11, and he reveals the foundation. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. That Jesus is the foundation upon which not only the church must be built, but it is the only foundation that can secure your soul for all eternity. It is the only foundation that can stand not just the test of time, but the test that goes beyond time. It reminds me of a very famous story that Jesus told when he gathered his disciples and he gave the most famous sermon, the best sermon that's ever been preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus concluded that entire sermon with this parable. He said, he said everyone who hears these words of mine is like a man, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Jesus tells a story about two houses that have been built. And I want you to notice that almost everything in this parable is the same for both builders, is the same for both houses. As far as we know from what Jesus said, the houses appear appear to be exactly the same. They appear to be built of the exact same material. We have no indication that there's anything different. But notice the other thing that's the same about both these houses. The rain and the storm came to both houses came to both houses because here's something that you need to know that regardless of the foundation upon which your soul is is founded and resting there will still be storms that will come into your life and in fact it is because the storms that will inevitably come to your house that the storms that will inevitably come your way regardless of the foundation that is why it is important for you to consider and think about the foundation upon which your soul is being built The houses were the same, the storms came to both, but you can only tell the difference in the foundation after the storms come through. You can only be certain of the foundation of your soul after the storms of life and the trials of life come. It it is after the unexpected happens that you begin to see what is the foundation of my soul? Is it really founded on the eternal rock of Jesus Christ? When the storms pass through, as Jesus said they will, he said, I will cause my rain to fall on the good and the evil alike. I will cause the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, just the same. The circumstances of your life are gonna be the same as anybody else. People lose their jobs, the economy turns south. Children go astray, 
People die. There's divorce. All these things happen to all of us the same. The storms will come. But the question is, when the storm comes, what is the foundation upon which your soul is resting? Your soul needs a foundation, and it needs to be a foundation that will carry you through all eternity. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 3 again and see how Paul carries this forward. He says, now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, here it comes, each one's work will be manifest for the day will disclose it. He, Paul is saying the same thing Jesus said. There is coming a day that will disclose it. What is that day? Some of you have already been through that day several times. You've gotten the report or the news you didn't want to get. And you're enduring maybe the storm even right now. The day is upon you even now. But you've got confidence of knowing that your soul is firmly resting on the foundation of Jesus Christ. For others, you find the storm coming and you're feeling like a sinkhole is coming up from under you. But listen, what if this storm that is coming is God's way of saying, hey, would you center your life on me? What if God uses the storm and the struggle to say, hey, I know it's tough right now, but what if this storm is coming to say, by my grace, would you trust me to know that there are more storms, storms that will come after this, and would you consider founding your life on this eternal foundation that is Jesus Christ? Each one's work will become manifest. The work can only be revealed after the storm comes. The strength of the foundation can only be known after the day comes that discloses it. Because it will be revealed, Paul goes on, by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved but only as through fire. Now, I find this passage really, really interesting. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> because if you've been in church much and been in different kinds of churches, um, maybe you were raised in one of two kinds of churches where you were taught two different ideas about what it means to be saved. One idea might have looked something like this, where, where we sort of treat salvation like a life insurance policy. You know, we come to faith in Jesus, we put our faith and trust in Jesus, and then, like, we've got it. And then we can go on and live our life however we want to live our life because we have got our life insurance policy secure. My eternity is secured in Jesus, but I am, that's the foundation is laid. But I am building on that with all kinds of materials that are not adequate, okay? And maybe some of you have heard this idea of salvation. is No, 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 no. Uh, yes, you should believe in Jesus, but if you really want to be saved, you're going to have to work really hard. Because God is sort of keeping score up there. And at the end of time, it is Jesus plus all your good works outweighing all your bad works, right? Now, people probably didn't say it that crudely to you, but in some way, that's what we pick up. That's the message we somehow pick up. But, but here's what Paul's saying. Paul is saying both of those are wrong. What he is saying is salvation does come by grace through faith alone in Jesus. Build your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. But he's also saying, after you've built your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ, be careful how you build on that foundation because the trials of life will come and at the end, there will be a testing. And he says, you're, you will be saved, but as one through a fire. What you're building might not endure the, the trials and the difficulties of life. And so you sort of make it in by the skin of your teeth is kind of what Paul's saying. He's saying how you build your life on the foundation of Jesus ultimately determines your eternal destiny, but how you then build on that foundation determines the quality of your life because your life in Jesus doesn't start when you die. It starts the minute you accept Jesus. Heaven doesn't begin when you leave this earth. Heaven begins when you invite Jesus to come in and be the Lord of your life. You become a citizen of a different kingdom at that point. And that's what Paul is saying. And he concludes it with this in verse 16. Do you not know that you, and we could just insert there your soul, because I think that would be a valid way to describe this passage. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Why is the care and feeding of your soul so important? Paul says because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
It's not about temples built by men anymore as it was in the Old Testament because you yourself become the temple that the Holy Spirit comes and who he wants to work in and through you in the world today. But in order for that to happen, you have to have a foundation. Your soul needs a foundation. And here's what I know is true of my life because it's happened so many times. Go through this life, go through a storm, go through a trial, and I just find what I'm building on the foundation of Jesus begins to shift a little bit. You ever felt that? Like I just find I wake up one day and I realize I'm off center. I, I have the foundation of Jesus, but I'm beginning to migrate. <laughs> I'm beginning to build with, with materials that aren't adequate anymore, and I'm beginning to shift. And I have to come back time and again and reevaluate, is my soul centered on Jesus? Because there's another storm coming. If you're not in one now, there's one coming, I promise. And so I have to be sure that my soul is centered on Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to encourage all of us to do as we continue to focus on the care and feeding of our souls. Regularly examine your soul to be sure that it is centered on Jesus Christ. This is not, I prayed to receive Jesus when I was nine, which I did and I'm so grateful for. So therefore, I never worry about it again. My salvation is secure, but what I have to do on a regular basis, daily, and sometimes multiple times in a day, is examine my soul to be sure that my soul is centered on that foundation that is Jesus Christ, because there's a lot in this world that's trying to throw me off center. Temptations, news, situations, circumstances. Every day I wake up, within just a few hours, if not sooner, Something is trying, a wind is blowing against my life and it is trying to move me off center. So I need every day to re-examine my soul to make sure that it is centered on Jesus Christ. I want to introduce to you a concept that some of you may have heard if you've been from different faith traditions. I know if you come from a Baptist or some other uh, evangelical background, you may not have heard of this practice, but it's a great ancient practice that, that I want to introduce to you. It is called the prayer of examine. The prayer of examine. This is a prayer that you do at the end of the day. And let me describe it to you because it is not like a prayer where you just sit down and tell God all the things during the day that you're thankful for and the things that you want him to do. That's not this kind of prayer. This kind of prayer is you sitting down with God at the end of the day and just reviewing the day with him. This is you asking the Holy Spirit at the end of the day to say, all right, Holy Spirit, this is what happened when I woke up. And this is what happened this is what I said to my family. This is how I reacted when I got to work. This is what I did through the day. Holy Spirit, would you show me anything in the course of my day that might have moved me off center from the foundation that is Jesus Christ? Would you show me today anything in my life, any materials that I've used, temporary, insufficient materials that I've been using today to build my life that will not stand the test of time, and the storms that come. Holy Spirit, would you show me? And you sit before the Lord and you ask him to bring those things to mind. And here's what will happen. <clears throat> you will think of the most strange thing that you would have never thought about. Something will come up, some word that you said to somebody, some thought that you had, some action that you took. And the Holy Spirit might say, hey, you know what? Let's talk about this. Let's think about this right here. And you might think, well, what's, what is that? But, but maybe God would reveal to you through that prayer of examine something in your life that day that is just ever so slightly moving you off center. Some material that's not going to last, that's not going to endure, that's eventually going to be burned up. And he's lovingly trying to remind you, stay centered. Stay centered on Jesus. Because there are sinkholes that are going to open up in your life. And you need a firm foundation of Jesus. So I want to share with you five things Five ways that might indicate that your soul is moving off center. These are really helpful to me. These are by John Ortberg from his book, Soul Keeping. Five indi indications that your soul is off center. Now, here's one of the things you can do with this. If you've never used the prayer of examine before, you could take this list and at the end of the day, just sit before the Lord and ask God each of these five, God, did any of these five things happen to me today? All right. And it, and it may be helpful. So I'm going to give you these five things as a really practical way to help you make sure that your soul stays centered on Jesus Christ. The first one is you have, a difficult, you have difficulty making decisions. I am not talking about where you eat lunch. Because that would be most of you. 
The fact that you have a difficult time deciding where you're going to have dinner or what you want for dinner or what you're going to wear is not an indication that your soul is off-center. What I am talking about when, when I say that you have difficulty making decisions is these are significant decisions <clears throat> in relationship to your spiritual well-being. So, for example, you have a certain clarity about how to and how not to live your life for the care of your soul, but you have a really difficult time deciding to do the right thing. I know I should be doing this, but I just can't do it. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I just keep doing it. If you find yourself struggling with decisions in relationship to your, uh, to your encounters with God, to morality, to ethical decisions, that is an indication that your soul may be off center. Second, you feel constantly vulnerable to people or circumstances. Constantly vulnerable to people or circumstances. If you're losing sleep over the 2024 election, your soul may be off center. Now, I know we kind of chuckle at that, but, but I know people. I know people who are very upset and losing sleep over the economy, over the weather. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take precautions when you hear about the next hurricane that's coming to Jacksonville. I'm, that's not what I mean. I just mean if you find yourself with an unrealistic level, an, an unmanageable level of a sense of vulnerability over circumstances that you have no control over, it is an indication that your soul is off-center. Your soul is off-center at that point. If your boss or your friends constantly make you feel insecure, your soul may be off-center. You feel constantly vulnerable to people or circumstances. Your soul may be off-center. Third, you lack patience or feel restless. Now, this one gets really close to home for me. Because I find that most of the time, this is the number one indicator that my soul is off center. Have you ever just had that, uh, just that sense of impatience inside of you? And so it happens for me in the dumbest places. I, I'm, that, that Yahoo that's in front of me on the road, like, what are you doing? You know, you, you go into a line at a grocery store and the cashier may be a little slow or the person can't get their card out of their wallet and you just feel that sense. Like that is, that's a minor one. But I'm gonna tell you, for me, that's an indication, Gary, what's going on with your soul right now. You need to be aware of it. Have you ever found yourself in a restless, so restless that you like everywhere you are, you're just constantly thinking about where you gotta go and what you gotta do next? And when you get there, you're already restless about the next thing you gotta do, or you have nothing to do at all and you still find yourself restless and you don't know why. That's an indication that your soul could be off center. Another thing that could be an indication your soul's off-center is you are easily thrown. You're easily thrown. And what I mean by this is when something doesn't go your way or something isn't just the way you like it, your day falls apart. You lose your temper because something isn't just perfect. It isn't just so. You're easily thrown by circumstances around you. Minor inconveniences and annoyances can ruin your entire day. You are easily thrown. Number five, you find your identity in externals. You find your identity in externals. You may define yourself by your accomplishments, by your title, by your physical appearance, by your friends, by how much money you have. You find your identity in those things. And if any of those things are challenged or any of those things are, are taken away from you, everything starts falling apart for you. Why? Because your soul is off center. Your soul is off center. So I would just encourage you, encourage all of us in the care and feeding of our souls, maybe just a few minutes at the end of every day to sit these five circumstances before us and say, is my soul on center today? Is there anything in my life that is pulling my soul off center? And here's a great question. John Ortberg closes this section out with a great question that I'm convinced if I were to ask myself this question regularly throughout the day, my soul would grow healthier and healthier and I would stay on that foundation that is Jesus. Great question. Will this situation block my soul's connection with God? As I go into any circumstance, will this situation block my soul's connection with God? Because if it will, then I am moving off center. There are three things that will always decenter your soul. One is sin. Sin will always decenter your soul. Two is worry. 
Worry always decenters your soul. And third is hurry. Yeah, I know, that one hurts. Hurry always decenters your soul. So I just want to ask you today, first of all, is your soul centered on Jesus Christ? Today, not when you were nine or when you were 12 or when you gave your life to Christ, not when you had that spiritual mountaintop experience, I'm asking today, is your soul centered on Jesus Christ? He may be your savior. I'm asking if he is your foundation. Is sin, worry, or hurry shifting your soul off center? I wanna invite you today to choose to make Jesus the foundation of your soul and your life. And if you have never trusted in Jesus, it starts with that. It starts with the simple confession that you need a foundation, a foundation that will carry you through not just a lifetime, but through eternity. Would you make Jesus the foundation of your soul?